and welcome to Fast Casual. I'm your host, Miranda Kopchak. This narrative dives into how franchises can scale their operations while maintaining high standards of quality, service, and operational efficiency. I'm joined today with the executive team members from CMG who own and operate everything from KFC Taco Bells, Little Caesars, Sonics, to Hilton's. In order to do this introduction justice, I'm going to pass it over to Al, Nick, Ron, and Pushpack to introduce themselves to our listeners and give us a quick look into their incredible journey before diving into this incredible episode. And I'll pass it over to you, Al. Thanks so much for, for joining us today. Oh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us, Miranda, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to share our, our story and uh, whatever little knowledge uh, we have. So yeah, my name's Al Bakta. I'm with uh, CMG Companies. I'm one of the founding principals uh, of CMG, along with my partners that are on the call today. I've been um, involved in the multi-unit franchise space uh, with sort of the foundations of CMG since, uh, since 2001, so almost uh, going on 25 years here uh, soon. So wow. uh, glad, glad to be on the call. Yeah, and Nick, kind of will pass it over to you. So I'm only 27, so I've been with everybody since <laughs> I was two years old, it seems like. So, uh, one, of the, one of the principals, as Al mentioned, and uh, been with CMG and uh, started CMG 25 plus years now. So it's been a fun ride. Still going, still going, so. Still, still in growth mode. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and Ron, what about you? Yeah, same. Uh, so, you know, met these guys in, um, you know, high school and college time frame and, uh, you know, best of friends and, uh, you know, kind of kicked off our journey as well together. Uh, so one of the founding, uh, co-founding principles as well, um, you know, and, you know, now, uh, you know, take care of the support center, help out with the, the back office, a uh, little bit of business development and, uh, you know, focus on, uh, you know, how to kind of continue to help out with the businesses that we have. And because you're from Philadelphia, I'm going to take a sip out of my Cowboys mug right now. I will say, I will say, which is not going to make you happy, Ron. It's probably going to make anybody listening from Philadelphia really mad, too. I'm originally from New York, so I'm a diehard Giants fan. Oh, wow. Which, so this still applies then. <laughs> which, is, which is not great being in Philadelphia um, during football season. But <laughs> I, like, walk through the streets, like, ducking my head. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny. My my uh, my mom, my dad, all my family members, my boyfriend, they're like, do not wear your Giants hat out. I'm like, okay, I promise. <laughs> it, is, it is Philadelphia. <laughs> it is Philly. So, uh, but I, I try to be loyal to the Sixers. So I don't have a, I don't have a basketball team. <laughs> and, I'll, and push back, take us, take us home before we dive into some of these questions that I've got for you guys. Yeah, like the same as that, we're five active partners. One of, uh, one of our partners, Manish Patel, is not able to be on the call, uh, but uh, we're five active partners met in, you know, met in high school and college timeframe. So uh, founder with CMG uh, as well. I'm the third tallest in the group. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure that Ron and Manish know about that, but I'm the third tallest in, in, and uh, you know, my day-to-day -day responsibility is um, kind of running the KFC Taco Bell portfolio uh, for, for CMG companies. Amazing. I think that's finger licking good. I... It's finger -licking. <laughs> and Miranda, you want us to, you want me to take a couple of minutes just to give the full background of the group itself in terms of just... I would you... love that because that was actually going to be my next question. Kind of, you know, I this is this is my first time learning that you guys all met in like college. Where and where did you guys go to school? How did this come to be? Like, what was your first brand? Like, I have so many more questions outside of operational efficiency that <laughs> could completely derail us. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, yeah, I think I can sort of help with that. I mean, I, obviously, we, we're all out of we're all based in Dallas, and outside of Nick, he actually lives in New Mexico, but when we, he went to college here in Dallas, we all went to University of Texas, Dallas, in, in, in uh, different, you know, we were there basically around the same time, so knew of the same people and, and got to know each other then. So, but uh, yeah, I mean, we started, you know, everything we have today has a multi-unit franchise component to it. Um, that probably wasn't the original thesis, but we were all fairly entrepreneurial even even in our early days and and so you know we, we all come from 
fairly humble beginnings. So, you know, we're all sort of first and second generation, uh, you know, c come from India and our parents come from India. So it's sort of, you know, no, nobody was born on third base. We had to sort of figure it out on our own. We had to fund our own school. You know, we had to figure out how to pay for pay for school and our and our cars and, 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 and beyond that. So we, we sort of always had to find a way to hustle and, and um, you know, this thing sort of started as a side hustle for all of us, you know, from that standpoint. But, uh, uh, you know, they, they didn't used to call it a side hustle back then, but I, I sort of laughingly say now it's a now it's a cool thing to say side hustle, but back then we, did, we didn't know, we just called it a second job. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, yeah, we started, you know, again, late 90s, we, we started getting in the franchise businesses and um, sort of our first foray, even, even sort of prior to formalizing our partnerships, you know, we were in, Bushbook was in a brand called Blimpy, uh, and, you know, Manish, got, Manish and uh, Bushbook was in a brand called uh, Fina Gas Station at the time. So these are sort of branded opportunities, uh, but uh, li sort of later in life, we, we started with a, a really small brand uh, in, in, a, in, in Dallas here called Genghis Grill. It was a, a two-unit concept at the time, and we were one of the original franchisees of the concept. So that sort of was the original, sort of laid the foundation of mm -hmm. sort of well, what I would say is our first brand and our first store. Um, you know, we later bought a corporate store, and then we ended up buying another franchisee store, and then ended up, uh, you know, sort of buying the brand, went from three stores as franchisees to becoming the franchisor. Again, not by, not by any type of strategy, more, more from desperation and the brand was going through some struggle, but the three of the stores we had were doing well. And, and long story short, we had to sort of buy it because we were sort of the only <laughs> ones uh, uh, surviving with the brand and doing well with it. But uh, that, you know, later in life, that, that, that we started diversifying sort of outside of that brand. And that's how we got into KFC and Taco Bell with one store yeah. in 2009. And that one store has led to 100, 80 plus stores today in within the Yum brand system and started with four stores in Sonic and that's led to 125 plus stores in Sonic and wow. and so on but but ultimately we 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 sort of started as operators we're very much operators at heart uh, mm -hmm. and Bushwick mentioned you know he's you know he's in charge of one of the larger portfolios Nick's got uh, the, you know the Little Caesar Sonic portfolio that reports into him Ron's got a, a, a fairly important role with back office. You know, we're also in non-food franchises with um, Ace Hardware and Rena Center and Valvoline, and so those those things sort of roll up into me. So each one of us, and Manish, who's not here, handles uh, our sports franchise investments, et cetera. Wow. So we're again, but franchisees and operators at heart. You know, that's sort of where we started. We we all. Uh, you know, started in the restaurants ourselves, you know, we worked them ourselves, went through training ourselves, you know, that, that's, that's sort of our bread and butter. So I know that should hopefully lead into yeah. what we want to talk about today, which is sort of how to scale and, and how to grow, right? So. so were all of you guys general managers or working on the ground, I guess, what, what drew you towards like the franchisee space and specifically in the hospitality space? Like, what was that like moment where you're like, this is, this is what we want to become franchisees and, and create this essentially empire um, and, and really scale. Yeah, I'll let Nick or Nick or Ron, Nick or answer. Or go. Yeah. go ahead, Nick. You're saying, no, no, you're saying, right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, you know, before we got into the Genghis Girl brand, uh, you know, we got, we got rejected to be part of a few systems as well as a franchisee just because. You know, we were young, you know, we were, you know, we were low on capital, right? So, I mean, there was a bunch of different things that happened, and that was right around, like, after 9-11 had happened. So, uh, so you know, we were looking to uh, kind of, you know, execute a playbook, and, you know, just as it would, you know, fit our, you know, life story is that we would do something that doesn't have a playbook. So, so we got, that's how we kind of got into Genghis Grill to follow the franchise system. But, you know, one thing led to another, and, uh, you know, we... Uh, we became a franchisor while we're operating our own locations, uh, thinking that you know you know we would we would continue to develop the DFW market where you know that's our home base. So we would open up you know six or seven units and continue to you know operate the Genghis Grill brand if you know nothing else you know happens right with the brand. But you know fortunately we kind of uh, you know were able to 
you know, put our heads together, you know, kind of create some efficiencies in terms of lowering cost and, you know, figuring out, figuring out you know, how to purchase things better and, and kind of operate with lower volume units, but then, you know, trying to, you know, trying to make money off of those low volume units and then slowly but surely just kind of got our MBA by learning on the job, basically. Yeah. Right? So, um, and then that's how we kind of kicked off the, the, the journey to restaurant operations, um, just by, you know, working each and every single position. So I think you asked earlier about what position did we work, but, you know, I was a dishwasher, a busboy, a server, um, you know, Al was doing the same thing along with being a bartender, you know, kind of coming up with different marketing initiatives, ideas to maintain or grow sales. Nick was spearheading, you know, as a manager, um, you know, working with our teams in the back of, back, of, back of the house, front of the house, you know, kind of, you know, learning on purchasing, you know, optimally in terms of what's good in terms of keeping our food cost in line, um, you know, kind of learning on the job about, you know, labor management, um, you know, so all those things just kind of are, you know, you kind of learn about it in, the, in a system. We kind of created a system uh, yeah. and learned, you know, on the go, right? Uh, uh, so that's, you know, that's kind of our journey, how it started. And then, you know, as we got into and became a franchisor, we put those learnings on paper and created, you know, operations manual and efficiencies for other folks who wanted to come on board as a franchisee and started to grow with the with the brand and you know obviously we were you know we were wearing multiple hats like Al said you know from, from day one not just now uh, but you know just you know how to you know how to kind of uh, make sure that we pick the right sites in terms of real estate how we you know how do we kind of uh, make sure that uh, construction costs are in line you know how do we purchase in terms of new store openings with you know FFNE and and, and so forth right so there's multiple yeah. things on play um, which kind of obviously we didn't know where we were going to be as we are today but just you know doing things that are kind of right for the business right for you know our folks um, you know our team members right and, and then obviously eventually the franchisees as you know we were operators in the trenches with them so they kind of appreciate that as well that hey look we're looking at the same P&Ls that you guys are looking at and we're trying to create and, and, and share best practices as uh, you know, as you're kind of applying in different markets and, you know, learning, learning from them as we're learning from our own operation. Yeah. I love that, that, that line there that you got your, M you got your MBA by doing. Um, I think that's, that's brilliant. And I think to that point, that kind of segues me to, to one of my first questions is like, what are, I guess, were the key operational challenges that you encountered as your brands have grown and do they differ now that you guys have hundreds upon hundreds of brands versus that of, you know, maybe one, two, three, four, five brands in the early 2000s? Um, I know that was kind of a two-folded question, but um, yeah, I kind of, will, you know, kind of pass it over to the experts here. I wish I could make, I think. I, I think that's Nick. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab at it, and then I'll let Pushbook kind of get into it as well. But uh, operationally, it's it's uh, you know scaling from one to ten to a hundred. Uh, they're all different uh, you know levels that you got to kind of contend with. Um, it's much easier operating one restaurant versus ten restaurants versus a hundred restaurants. Uh, it, it's also having the right people in place. I think that's a big part of it, right? You got to make sure that the people that you uh, bring on uh, are bought in. Um, understand the system and uh, how you want to grow so it, it, it caters to trying to uh, hold the brand standards which the franchisor has and then you know meeting our personal you know uh, standards at each one of the you know CMG companies and, and meshing both of them together and growing from that platform right so push back yeah uh, I think uh like you said it, uh, we're on the landed podcast and uh, it's all about people. Uh, it's always been all about people for us, uh, starting from one restaurant to, to many. The challenges are still the same. Uh, it's, it's making sure that we find the right people all the time, whether you're running one or 100 restaurants. The challenges, as Nick, Nick spoke about, it's about finding the leaders and making them a leader. Uh, you know, being in franchisee business, the franchisees or franchisor give us a playbook that we can play with, which applies in, in, the, in the restaurant, in the box. But outside the box, there's a system and process that has to be created. And those are challenges that we grow, as we grow, we have to address. So while 
they may teach us how to cook food and then serve the food. But outside the box, what needs to happen, whether it be simple as depositing the money to all the way to uh, doing performance reviews, all that needs to be done and we have to have a process for it. So as we grow, those are the things we're trying to solve. That's actually such a, I never thought about it that way, Pushpak. Like, you know, you, you're handed essentially, you know, a, a playbook or a guide of, of sorts to begin, to, you know, to uphold the, the corporate values, bring them to the ground, um, how to, you know, make a burger, how to make finger licking good chicken or, you know, a, a quesadilla or whatever that may be. But, you know, what's going to make or break um, a franchisee is, you know, how they think outside the box to, like, essentially grow um, and build, you know, a name for themselves at, you know, as, as that franchisee group. Um, That's correct. What kind of like segues me into that next point is like, how are you ensuring consistency in product quality, service, uh, you know, your people across different locations, especially in those international markets? Like, how are you guys thinking outside of the box, um, you know, from one to five stores where, you know, you can manage and kind of keep, you know, your, your values to hundreds of locations and consistently thinking outside of that box. Yeah, I, I can start. Um, I, I think we got to look at it, um, you know, from communication standpoint, right? So, we, you know, we, we bring our cell phones with us everywhere we go. Uh, we have chat groups set up with the ops team. Uh, they allow us to kind of uh, be in tune with what's happening, right? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We recently launched a, a new burger at Sonic called the Smasher. And, uh, you know, throughout the last few weeks, uh, when we when we were soft selling it, I was having all the stores send me a photo of it being prepped, being being put together, right? So once they put it together, uh, we tweaked the model. I, you know, I wanted to see it myself, and then, uh, you know, our VP of Ops kind of jumped in and said, hey, here's what we see wrong. We're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. We're going to fix this. More recently, I was in some stores over the weekend, and... Uh, they've been continue, uh, continue to execute properly with that, right? So uh, very, very uh, excited to see what comes of it, and we've got to continue the execution of it, right? So I, I personally took photos of each one of the burgers, and uh, it, it's to the same that we got earlier, right, a few weeks ago. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that. i just say, Nick, you're absolutely right. I think it's, for us it's all about process, right? As long as we um, have the process and training for it, uh, I always compare ourselves to U.S. military. You know, anybody can join. Anybody can join the military, but you make them a, a, a you know, a boy is a young man, a young young woman joins the military, but military makes them a man or a woman that we respect, and it's because of the process that they put in, uh, and and that's the, that's what we try to do. And I think all of us will speak to it. Our culture is what drives our our company. Uh, we are huge on culture, as Al called it earlier. Uh, we're operators, and I think what he's what he's saying is we're we're a huge culture. We're all huge people, in people business for sure. Uh, we love our people. I mean, we have 8,000 plus strong strong family members, and uh, we don't get it always right. Uh, we're always trying to be better, but we the way we got here is through people. Yeah. And 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 training them and process is what 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 get what takes a. Uh, and it sounds like to me, and 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 Nick, to your point of. That I love that example of like you're launching a new burger, you're having, you know, everybody send you pictures of them prepping the burger and all that. So it sounds like even though you guys are this, you know, executive leadership team, you've, you've scaled, you've been in, you've, you, it sounds like you're still in the stores too. Like you're still making sure that your boots are on the ground, really supporting and, and driving these processes, your visions, your culture values, um, and making sure that you're, you're still kind of in the trenches back to the military reference, but I guess, is that is that correct? Yeah, I would say, I mean, we, it's tough to, we're, we're 470 locations in 30 states. I mean, it's tough to always be in locations. I think our role now is more, is, is we're not disciplinarians in the sense, like Nick is doing it just to sort of, it's a new launch, it's important for Sonic, but it's more about setting the right message and standard about, hey, it's early on, let's execute properly. But mm -hmm. I mean, like Nick, it would be impossible. I'm sure he didn't get all 125 Sonics to send him a picture either, right? It's sort of sort of impossible to get to all 470, even amongst the five of us. Um, but we, we love being in the stores when we can. A lot of it's to celebrate the good things they're doing right. 
uh, and to sort of you know do some of the bonuses and, and, and try to try to do some of the celebrational things that that actually matter and, and back to culture as Bushbuck said we we love doing that um, whenever we can I, I think all of us would wish we were in the stores more and frankly that I wish that's all we ever did and had no, had no other role I think we'd be pretty good at it uh, <laughs> but it is it is more um, more pom poms, you know, and, and sort of celebrate uh, our team and, and, and sort of the victories they have on a day to day and a month to month and a year to year basis. So. Yeah, and I think one thing that's super interesting is as you guys have, have scaled, it's, you know, it sounds like, you know, you guys had mentioned like first store, first kind of dab into the franchisee space is, is pre, is post 9 11, like right after 9 11. You know, you mentioned you know, 2009, so right now we're in the heart of the recession. Um, and now we're, you know, in, in 2024. So it's it feels like that might have just been yesterday. But, I mean, time has certainly passed. And I'd love to hear, um, you know, what role technology has played in maintaining your operational excellence and really, like, how technology has essentially, like, evolved um, from the operations perspective and, like, what you've seen through these different, these different periods, um, you know, in society. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I figured that Ron, you were thrown us, but no. I think what what Al said earlier, you, you know, it's with technology and Nick. What Nick mentioned is absolutely right. Technology makes it easier for us to be in our stores, not physically, but at least with data wise and being in there. I mean, imagine trying to do getting those pictures in 1980s, 1990s. It's not going to happen. So, it's not as it's not as uh, 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 hard as it used to be to be in the restaurants with cameras and technology that we have now. So while the technology has made it a lot easier for us to access data, but it's also made it very challenging for our people to run a restaurant. Uh, in, in my belief, you know, when we, were, when we were running restaurants, we had to run restaurants and take care of people, making sure our customers are great. But now when you hire a restaurant manager, they have to understand how, to, how the technology works too. So they have to have this one more skill set that they probably didn't have before, how to uh, how to use iPads, how to use all the technologies that's around them. So it is becoming a challenging to run a restaurant with, I mean, think about DoorDash, Uber Eats, Landed, uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, everything that we involve, in, everything you do today involves technology and that affects our restaurants. So yeah. while it's making it easier on one end, it's also making it hard, which also gives us uh, opportunity to to fix some of that and train on on training. The love hate relationship. <laughs> Absolutely, always. <laughs> it's a real push pull. <laughs> you know, Al Al loves emails. I hate emails. That's how it is. Yeah, like I think we, with with um, you know AI and all that, with all the new buzzwords, like will it take away from someone eating food and, and replace that? No, right? But it, it, it always going to need people to do some certain things especially some of the core businesses that we're in but like we can't kid ourselves a lot of job functions will go away right? something we have to always think about right it's a we're in the people business but technology sort of you know is, is embedded in everybody's lives and and only going to get um it's only going to get better and so we've got to embrace it we can't sort of push it away i think generally as a as, as cmg companies as a group all of us are we're always looking for new, you know, technologies and new ways to do things more efficiently. Um, I think we're pretty good about it. Um, we may not be the fastest to adopt, but we're at least good about learning and seeing what's out there and not sort of turning a blind eye or ignoring absolutely. that a change is coming, you know. So. Absolutely not. Right. I, I, yeah, I want to clarify. Absolutely not. We absolutely are pushing our restaurants to make sure that we are using the latest and greatest technologies and adapting to it. The challenge that I'm talking about is while we're doing that, we've got to make sure that our restaurants are not overly uh, burdened with new learnings all the time. Uh, and so that is a challenge we have to solve because technology is here to stay. And obviously it makes our, all of our jobs a lot easier. In fact, a lot more efficient. Yeah. So, and I feel like it, it probably comes down to also implementing the right technology. There's, there's a, so, a solution for everything. Isn't it? There's an yeah. app for that, right? Yeah, there's an app. There's an app for everything. Sometimes I'm like, how did I not think of this app? I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, I'm like, where was I? Like, right. this, this is 
you know, how did I not think of that? But there seems to be like an app for everything. And it's, you know, it becomes which pieces of technology make the most sense. Correct. Um, what are need to haves versus that of like a nice to have. Um, so yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, and to your point, I feel like we're, we're moving more and more in the direction of just like more technology and, but again, it's, the love hate relationship it's you know some of this is it's great and then some of it you're like okay m maybe not right now <laughs> <laughs> so true this is a question for all of you i guess can like discuss any specific processes or sims or systems that you you know implemented um to support consistent operations i guess like to that point like what is either a system a process a piece of technology that has become essentially a need to have in growing, you know, your, your businesses and continuously scaling. Yeah. I, you know, I'll go at it and then people can take a stab at it. Um, but we have like, for example, we have a daily, weekly, monthly, pro quarterly processes, right? So for example, every period there's something, what we call is PBR, which is a period business review. So it doesn't matter how many technologies we have implemented. We still want to meet with the RGMs and go over the numbers. Uh, those are the things that are, you know, franchise or out of the box doesn't give you. So you put that in quarterly ways. We do something called stewardship where we bring all the area area managers and let them present their business to us in a way of what challenges are having, what do they want to, what do they want to do to fix it and then measure them and hold them accountable next quarter for that. So technology is there, but at the same time, you've got to meet our, meet our folks uh, on a, on a, you know, on a frequency basis. And, and, uh, those are the processes that we've put in to make sure that, uh, the trains go wherever we want to go. Yeah, yeah. That I mean, that that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I guess like, how do you guys currently today like measure that operational success? And like, what metrics like do you prioritize like as as you scale? Because I'm sure, even across different brands, I'm probably sure there's different metrics that you're looking to prioritize. And um, I guess like, what? How do you guys kind of narrow it down? Yeah, and I'll go Nick first, and then maybe you can add on to that. Um, yeah, I mean, for us, you know, I'll give you an example in, in Sonic, for example, you know, we have our own AOPs and KPIs that are kind of driven down from the brand itself. And hey, look, here's, here's what, you know, 2024 and beyond looks like for Sonic, for example, right, where, you know, we're fortunate that, uh, you know, Nick actually sits on the FAC committee um, and gets, you know, gets uh, eyes and ears and attention from the leadership team at Sonic, which, uh, you know, which kind of helps drive it down to us and our group. And, uh, you know, we can form a plan uh, of action there for our team members and, and kind of, you know, focus on, you know, what our core values are, what we want to get out of the business, uh, how do we make sure that there's, you know, proper budgets that are set up based on, you know, the volumes that we're kind of projecting to have, that, you know, for that year. And then our leadership team uh, that we've kind of, you know, brought on board to operate these restaurants is amazing where they have, you know, uh, they have a great history of operations of you know operating multiple restaurants previously in their previous life that now they're part of CMG team um, and they're running our restaurants right so so you know Nick um, or, or Pushbuck in their respective portfolios they'll go ahead and talk to the leadership team and then they'll sit down with them and kind of carve out a, a plan for our team members and say okay here's how we're looking at for this year and then this is what the brand is providing us um, you know in terms of uh, if a, if it's a new new products that are coming in a certain time of the year. Uh, how do we kind of uh, market those? How do we capitalize on those? What are the training process looks like? And how do we execute that, right? So I think based on those um, opportunities, we kind of put everything together in our own, you know, uh, under our own umbrella. And then we say, okay, our team's gonna do this, this, and this, um, you know, without going to too much specifics. And then we execute on it, right? So, and that will obviously hopefully lead to profitability and that growth for our team members and bonuses um, uh, come along with that, right? So I think those are some of the things that we kind of follow and take away from, um, you know, from the brands that we're involved with. And the brand itself has certain cadences and standards that they want us to follow. It, it could be speed of service or like Nick mentioned, how does a burger look, right? So what does the execution look like? What does the actual facilities look like, right? Because we do have brand standards that we need to be accountable for and that's what we're measured on, right? And then further down, if you drill into it, you know, we create our own measures and our own standards that are aligned with, uh, you know, the brand as well that are required by, you know, some of these brands that we're part of, right? Um, and I think, Nick, you can kind of 
maybe go dive deeper into that as well. Yeah, from a from a simplistic standpoint, you know, we from, on the restaurant side, looking at it from the two biggest expenses, right, our food and labor, we utilize that you know, third party vendors to help with, uh, you know, um, scheduling or inventory management, right? So that that you know some we have to make sure that it meshes with the POS system and we can integrate integrate with that, right? So uh, technology has helped from that standpoint considerably, right? Before we were writing schedules in Excel, now we have ways to forecast sales uh, based on last year's sales, last, you know, six weeks trends, uh, and then go off what's happening with any promotions, weather related, et cetera. All that kind of plays a part into these third party opportunities that are out there that we can help integrate within the POS. Um, so it's kind of seamless from that standpoint and, and we get our reporting needs from that. So whatever you put in there, we, we take that and then we can analyze it and you know evolve and make that schedule better. And the same goes with inventory, right? So um, making sure that we have proper inventory measures. Um, there's third party companies that help us track what we're buying uh, what we're selling and then what should be in the fridge, right? And then, you know, what what was uh, voided or what was stolen, et cetera, right? So it's all part of the business and uh, help, you know, just chip away at it and make that make that KPI better and better every every week, every period, every month, right? So. Yeah, um, it, it brings me back to that. I kept thinking um, while you were while you were explaining that that whole process, like what what were operators doing before even Excel? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, by their hand, right? <laughs> They're ready. Oh, yeah. You said Excel. I was like, oh my gosh, what was everybody doing before Excel? Though? <laughs> it worked. It worked. Yeah, I think I think Nick, you know, Nick, Nick and Al, uh, Ron summarize it. You know, sales. You're measuring sales. You're measuring transactions. You're measuring um, average ticket price. You're measuring, you know, food, labor. Talked about it. You're measuring speed. You're measuring uh, brand standards, balance scorecard. Whether whether it be food safety and, and standards that the brands have, whether it be whether it be for equipment or or, or or you know vote certificates, you're measuring customer feedback, and then you're measuring obviously employee you know employee turnover and, and, and job training. So I think these are like eight nine things that we talk about that are core to any business. Uh, yes, this is for for food business, but I'm sure there are similar ones that we have for other retail shop as well. Yeah, and as you were as you were like. Uh, portfolio just like got more and more diverse um, you know obviously I'm sure there's different uh, you know KPIs a across different brands even within different like you know industries and whatnot do you find that these KPIs like differ um, greatly across different brands and I guess can that be difficult to manage um, especially even across like industries too yeah I think we've you know it's a, it's been a learning curve you know we, we were obviously started in sort of restaurants and then we got into hotels and uh, you know as franchisees within Marriott or Hilton or IHG and then we've done sports franchise investing so that's a whole different you know <laughs> you know winning is important there right and you don't get to control a lot of that and then you've got sort of retail franchises that we op own and operate now with Rena Center or Ace Hardware or Valvoline and the, the KPIs are different. You know, labor is probably one that is a, you know, it's probably the, the, the one that's probably the only one that sort of, you know, cross-pollinates across all of the all of the industries and brands where, and yeah, that's, that's one of the big ones you have to worry about regardless of the industry, right? But, um, and it's, it's sort of a driver from your revenue and, and sales. But, you know, the other metrics is are, you know, the, 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 they're different, you know, they're de definitely different. Like, you know, Ace Hardware, you know, it's, it's not as, it, it's, 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 it's cogs in a different sense, but like the level of SKUs and in inventory management there is just, and it's not perishable and, you know, the seasonality of that business is different. Um, you know, Valvoline is more of a service business where, yeah, you're, you have some, you know, you're changing oil and some filters, so there are some cogs, but primarily it's a service business, right? Um, and 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 Rena Center, you know, it's a completely different business. It's, it's you know, managing a portfolio where you're renting product, and so it's more of a portfolio management business. So yeah, the, the KPIs and the metrics are different, uh, and uh, you got to learn. Uh, what those are, and like Ron mentioned, is that the brand sort of gives us, um, 
you know, the brand gives us sort of the benchmarks and the right KPIs. Uh, you know, they sort of lean you toward some technologies that sort of help with that. Uh, but, you know, like Nick mentioned, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Sometimes you have to find your own technology solutions to, to solve a problem within that particular industry and brand. So, you know, it's, a, it's sort of a, it's sort of a uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. It, you know, I wish it, one thing sort of transfers over. Uh, but we do create an annual operating plan, and our KPIs, you know, starts with the franchise awards playbook, as Ron said, and then, you know, what CMG's sort of playbook is on top of that, um, and, and to create that that plan. Um, and it, it takes time. You know, it, we're probably a lot more refined and tuned up in our KFC Taco Bell business because we've been doing it for 15 years, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas as opposed to Sonic, where we've only done it five years, or Rena Center, you know, five years. Like it's sort of a, you know, it takes time. It, you sort of get better and better, and tweak and change and modify <laughs> until you, to get to a, a lot point of trial where trial and you, error. Yeah, <laughs> until you get to a point where you're, you're starting to feel good about, you know, the annual operating plan and budgets and things on a on an annual uh, basis. <laughs> just yeah, just when you figure it out. I mean, just when you know you figured it all out, you get get hit with COVID and just everything changes. So then yeah, you have to re, yeah. you have to redo everything again. So. Yeah. I didn't sudden. even when I was going through all the all the uh, the, the life events, the, the historic events that occurred through your guys' growth. I didn't even I didn't even mention COVID. Um, you know, I went through, like you went nine eleven, the recession, COVID to today. There's just there's so much that you guys have seen, um, and I guess like this is going to be probably the most loaded question um, that that you that you hear. But you know if somebody's listening today and they've got they're thinking about maybe opening up their first you know franchise or they have their you know first five and they're looking to scale or whichever you know place in that that journey that they're at i guess like what piece of advice would you have for somebody who's looking to like grow and and become you know just you know just like cmg yeah i mean (laughs) i can big question there's a lot of (laughs) i can i can take it i'm sure everybody has their sort of opinion um yeah we have been through a lot and uh have seen sort of the have seen sort of the ups and downs and um you know our, we had you know much nicer hair and it was you know we, we had hair and we didn't we, we, didn't get, we weren't gray at that time but, uh, yeah i think someone going into it you know i think there's a lot more tools and a lot more podcasts and and youtube videos and a lot more resources that are there today than there were 25 years ago, right? That That's sort of a, a given, but so there, there's just access to more information, access to groups like us and franchisees uh, that want to do it our way. I mean, I know not, you guys aren't specifically franchisee focused. That's been our playbook and what we feel our downside has been protected through COVID or the, the recession, et cetera, is that being a franchisee uh, in a brand that's bigger than you um, is uh, is an important thing. But, uh, you know, the folks that are just sort of looking at trying to get to our level or want to get bigger than us, you know, it's, it's uh, I would say just take advantage of the tools and, and, and the information that's out there. Do take, take your time. There's, first of all, there's more franchise franchise systems that are out there and more opportunities in business that are out there than there were because... You know, again, like you said, technology is one piece of it, but the whole, you know, the internet, the fact that you can, you know, interact with a consumer and sell something to a consumer that could be a thousand miles away that you don't need a brick and mortar location anymore um, is, is, you know, that, that's, that's new, right? That's 25, that's 20 years old. That's 25 years old. It's not that old, right? Um and so at the end of the day, I mean, there, there's, just, there's just a lot more resources out there. And I would say the advice would be take your time, diligence it, um, and, and use everything that's out there to, to gain more knowledge, uh, you know, versus, you know, literally we were 30, 30 years away where we used to use a phone book, right? So just like <laughs> those, days are, those days are gone. But that literally when you, you know, we used to find a business for sale in a newspaper. Uh, yeah. And so, and, 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 I, and I don't think I'm that old, you know, but, you know. Our, you are. 
<laughs> so I used to dial. I used to dial. I used to dial four one one to get to uh, right. yeah. <laughs> to, to get a business's number or even my friend's number down the street. And that's like such a crazy foreign concept to like kids <laughs> pick up the phone, call an operator, and ask them to connect you to yeah. uh, you know your friend's house down the street because you didn't run their phone number. <laughs> that's a great point. Like most of us, you know how to. We go like this, or you know how to pick up a phone, or when you're playing Pictionary, <laughs> they're they're, do, they're doing this, right? They're just grabbing it like this. So it's like it's a completely different uh, ball game. But anyways, I would say, and I'm sure the other guys have other advice to young folks, but or, or folks starting out is sort of there's a lot of resources out there. We use them, take advantage of what's out there that just wasn't available even 20 years ago. So. Yeah, no, that's that's a. That's an incredible point. I think that's an incredible note to, to end on. Um, I really like appreciate the time that you guys you know gave me today. Um, I've definitely learned a great deal around you know operational efficiency. I, I definitely have to say one of my faults. I don't have that mindset the same way that some operators do, and that's something that like if I wanted to be you know a franchisee, I would need to learn that mindset. And I feel like as somebody who's learning more of that like operational um you know pnl mindset you guys have offered like a great deal of advice uh, insight you know strategy for for individuals that you know could be looking to to grow in the franchise space or in the business space doesn't you have to be a franchise um it could be any any sort of business endeavor and that, to that point um that you guys made earlier you got your mba by learning just by doing um which is absolutely the best way to learn is just by doing so uh, I, I think i think i think i want to add one more thing to that i know you want to end it i would say no no you, you got you gotta you gotta you gotta um uh, if you're young you're trying to grow you gotta find friends like we have uh, uh yeah. that fill that fill the gaps of your knowledge right because you one doesn't know everything uh and then you have to have friends that that you trust and and, and live and die by to to grow and so they can fill your gaps that you don't have and so uh, while i'm the third tallest i do have nice hair than all these other guys so i'm good right <laughs> i'm gonna need to see a picture of you guys why you're wearing glasses though he didn't, he didn't <laughs> that's that's the part that al fills and nick fills and ron fills out i'm gonna need to see a picture of you guys in your college days i'm sure that you have um yeah, i'm sure you guys have a picture of the of the four and five of you at, at genghis grill your first location. We'll have to make that the the picture of this podcast episode. Sounds good. Excellent. But I love. I know I love that. And and Pushpack, Ron, Nick, Al, thank you guys so much for for joining today. Um, I really can't thank you guys enough. And I I think our listeners are really gonna love um, the learnings that are gonna come out of this episode. Thank you.